Okay. All right. Now that today's meditation session is over, Martine Batchelor is joining One Mindful Breath in Wellington, Aotearoa, New, Ze New Zealand, from your home in France by Zoom to speak to us. So Martine was born in France in 1953 and ordained as a Buddhist nun in Korea in 1975, studying Son Buddhism for nine years at Songwangsa Monastery under the guidance of the late Master Kusan Tsunim. So Martine, we know that you speak French, English and Korean and you can read Chinese characters. And you've written many books, the most recent being The Spirit of the Buddha. And there are articles for magazines on the Korean way of tea, Buddhism and women, Buddhism and ecology, uh, and Zen cooking. And your next book is due out in a matter of days. And its title is, What is This? Ancient Questions for Modern Minds. And it's, I believe the first book you've actually co-authored with uh, Stephen, your husband, Stephen Batchelor. Um, so as well as teaching meditation retreats and workshops by yourself with Stephen, you also co-lead retreats worldwide. So we're now crossing to you live at your home in Southwest France. We don't know what you're going to be speaking about. So Martin, welcome to Wellington and over to you. Thank you. I uh, must say I don't know either uh, what I could talk about because uh, I don't really know what uh, you are interested in. So I was wondering, uh, is there any specific topic you're interested in or should we talk about something? The book coming out in a few days. Oh, sorry. Could you go? I was uh, suggesting the... Um, you could talk about your book, which is coming out in the next few days. Sure, sure. So in a way, I mean, what is interesting is that uh, we just finished uh, another song retreat in uh, England. So this is a retreat we've done for the last 30 years. And uh, one of the rare retreat England of that nature, which is using the question, what is this? And we do it also in the song style. And so two years ago, uh, the same similar retreat was recorded. Uh, so we give instruction, we give talks, and we do that for six full days. And so generally this retreat is not for beginners because uh, we see it several times in the day, uh, 45 minutes before breakfast, then there is a three session of 30 minutes and 10 minutes walking inside the hall, afternoon four session, and then in the evening one more session. And uh, so what we do on this and in the book is kind of trying to combine the fact that yes, this is a song retreat, but not totally in the traditional style, because we already had to adapt it in terms of the length, for example. Like in Korea, you would see it's three months, 10 hours a day, which is not really possible uh, to organize that so easily. And even doing uh, six full days, seven nights, we realize that most people, I mean, some people could do it, of course, but most people would not be able to do 10 times, 50 minutes and 10 minutes walking. Uh, we tried it once, and uh, at the end of the weekend, people could not walk. So we thought we have to adapt it. So we adapt it in terms of 30 minutes at the time that we're sitting, 30 minutes, 35 minutes. But we kept the walking inside. And what is interesting with this retreat, you could say in comparison to an inside retreat, more mindfulness retreat, where you're told to just go by yourself uh, individually, is that we walk inside the hall all together. And that really creates a special community atmosphere, which uh, a lot of people remark upon. And uh, so that's kind of something we wanted to keep. And if you were in Korea, you would just basically ask a question. You would just do what is this as a practice, as a technique. But because this is in a center which is uh, more used to mindfulness and inside practice, and we get people from a sound background, or we get people from an inside background or mindfulness background, then what we do is that we give three opportunities. Uh, either they can pay attention to the breath, either they can 
uh, ask the question or either they can do listening and they can also combine, complement these together. And then, so that's in terms of what in the book you will find, uh, which uh, that time we recorded all the instruction. So you get, when we do the instruction, we want to be relatively precise, kind of, you know, what are you supposed to do when you sit? And so, like, what is interesting in the song, Zen, Chan thing is that often you're not given much explanation. Uh, in terms of what do you do? Like if you go to Japan, they just tell you sit in front of the wall and that's it. Just have a good posture and sit. But what was really specific about our teacher, and I think partly about Korean Zen, is that they really want you to know what you're doing. They want to give you pointers, they want to give you suggestions. And so our teacher used to do that. He used to give a talk once every two weeks. And used to give something very zen that people are more familiar with, enigmatic. And then he would say, oh, now I'm adding heat to the snake, meaning I'm going to give some practical explanation. And I know for myself, those practical explanations were really useful in terms of the practice. And I'm still using them today. I'm still also teaching them. So that's why you have all the instructions. We have six instructions in terms of, you know, how to practice with the breath, with the questioning, with the listening. And then, of course, in terms of the book, uh, Stephen and myself are a little different presentation. And that's what you can see, actually, in the book, that you will have me giving an instruction, then Stephen an instruction, then me a talk, then an instruction. And at one level, you can see that Stephen is more philosophical, and he's going to bring all kinds of other things. And I saw so a very modern look at it. And me generally, I'll be more practical. How can you do this in terms of the instruction? And how can you use this in your daily life in terms of the practice itself, in terms of the teaching? And so you have the <coughs> evening talks, which again, you find in the book. And again, uh, generally what I do is something which is uh, relatively practical, like talking, for example, about great faith, great courage, great questioning, or talking about grasping or creative engagement, or talking about emptiness, because often this is misunderstood. And then Stephen might have a kind of a larger, more philosophical take on what the teaching means, and maybe connecting them to some Greek teaching, or Montaigne, or some poets or you know, that nature. So it will be kind of a modern, very secular look at the practice. So in a way, that's what you get in the book. Uh, the fact that the, both of us are there and it's kind of, you see really what kind of the framework of a retreat, which can also be interesting to see that. Can I add, Martine, just for the people here, that I've probably read the book about 20 times since I've edited it and put it together, and it's an absolutely delightful read. I'm really looking forward to just holding one in my hand and seeing it. It's a really nice book. It's a very nice book. Thank you. Could, can I just ask a general question, just about posture, you know, sitting posture in regard to meditation, what thoughts do you have on that from your experience so many years of the different positions people can meditate in and how important that is or not important. So you see what this you can see according to different traditions, uh, the posture will be more or less emphasized. And what I could say about the posture, you could say that the less thing you have to do in the meditation, so the more bare the meditation, generally the more important will be the posture. The more things you have in meditation, the less emphasized you'll have on the posture. So if you do soto zen, silent illumination zen, into like Japanese zen, then they just tell you to sit, face the wall, that's it, and then they put a great emphasis on the posture. If what is interesting with the Korean, that it's a song practice, but they put a little bit of emphasis on the posture, but not that much. They just want you to sit there, sit relatively straight, 
and but they won't in a way sacralize the posture or you can be have Tibetan Buddhism, and then in that practice, they don't say much about the posture. And uh, some people you can see don't have the perfect posture with them. Well, with the Soto Zen, they have amazing posture. I always enjoy when I have people coming from the Soto Zen, so the posture is like really. But the thing I have learned as a teacher is that not everybody can have that beautiful uh, Zen posture. So, First, the question is, do I sit on the floor? Do I sit on a chair? Uh, if you are relatively young, you don't have any physical problem, then yes, you can sit on the floor. And possibly over time, as some people learn to do the full lotus, but I don't think so many people are able to do that. Then otherwise you can do the half lotus, or you can do the Burmese posture, or you can, so that's just sitting on cushion. And then you have to see if you sit on cushion, uh, can I have my leg relatively flat? Or are they going to be a little high up? And then you need maybe to put some cushion. So it's kind of like what is important in terms of the posture is that you are relatively upright, but not tense, but not too loose, and that you are relatively stable. So <laughs> you can do this either on the cushion or on the chair. If you sit in a chair, generally I would recommend to sit in halfway on the chair if you can, so that you hold your back yourself, which will keep a more upright posture. But of course, if you have pain in the back, then you might be against the chair, but you really don't want to slouch. This is really what is important. You don't want to slouch. You want to be relatively upright. And so generally you can start the sitting with the, it's like the, Head going a little, the top of the head going a little toward the sky, and then you settle. Then you can notice, <coughs> let's say you sit for 30 minutes. Once might be okay, but like on a retreat, you sit several times, and so you get, you know, sometimes more and more pain. And so the question when you see it is do I get pain five minutes in, or do I get pain just toward the end? If you get pain five minutes in, then you have to change the posture because you don't want to be in agony. If you get a little pain at the end, then what you have to be careful is that when you stand up, the pain goes. If the pain continues, then you have to change the posture. So what you want to do generally when you sit on the floor on cushion is that your, your hip, you kind of have a little stand. And when you sit on a chair also, you want to have a tiny slant of the legs, of the upper legs. So you don't want to have your leg up like this. You want them a little bit down. They don't need to have dramatically down, but just a little down. So there is a little kind of, you have this up, you are able to sit more upright. So that's for the sitting on the floor. If you sit on the bench, what's interesting there is that if you sit on the bench, then it will be better for your back, but it could be worse for your knee. So you have to decide what, what's the weakest part of your body and what you can handle in terms of discomfort. So that's also the thing that some people really love the bench, some people prefer the cushion. Then if, you can, if for whatever reason you cannot do that on the floor, sit on a chair. And then again, if you sit on a chair, what is important is that you are relatively upright. Also, we have to see that is when we sit, we might have to adjust. So you don't want to move all the time, but you might want to adjust your posture because sometimes you tense up and then you want to relax a little bit. Sometimes you flop and then you want to become more upright. Then you have the question of the hands. So sometimes you can have it in the traditional posture like that, but only if it works for your physiology. So then you can have your hand on your knees or just in front of you. That's again, what does make you feel so comfortable that when, during the sitting I don't have to think about it? Then you have the eyes, and then some people suggest some tradition, you close the eyes, some you have the eyes are open, and some you have the eyes wide open. And it's not sacred, it's what works. Personally, I would uh, recommend if you're a little agitated, you can close the eyes a bit. If you're sleepy, don't close the eyes, keep them a little open. And if you're really sleepy, have them wide open. 
So again, what works for you, and as long as they're not tense. So that's what I would say on the posture. But you want to have a posture which is bright enough, alert enough. That's the one thing that you want to go, but according to your <coughs> physiology. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm, I'm just off the screen, but um, last time you spoke, you spoke about creative awareness. And I, uh, I thought that was really interesting because I suddenly realized that perhaps I'd limited um, myself with a bit of philosophy and so on, and I saw a different take on things, which was really, really interesting. Um, but I, I couldn't find out much more information. I raced around on the internet, as I normally do. Um, what would you recommend to find out a bit more about that? Uh, about what? Oh, sorry, creative awareness. Uh, creative awareness, okay. So the problem uh, why you can't find anything on it, I am one of the rare people who are using this term. I kind of created the term, and I'm not aware of anybody else possibly using it. So if you want to know more about it, generally you have to listen to my talks or read my books. Because I'm one of the person talking about it. Uh, and the reason, uh, the reason I decided to use this term was because it seemed that uh, what this, uh, to me I connected very much to the meditation. Because when I look at meditation, I think, what are we doing when we meditate? And so we are, as I very likely talked about last time, we try to anchor and we try to do experiential inquiry, looking deeply or questioning. And personally, I feel the anchoring leads us to be more calm, more spacious, and kind of diminish the automatic habits. And then the exp experiential inquiry and itself to be a little brighter and alone. And I feel that actually dissolves the obstacle to our ability to be wise and compassionate. And so if that goes down, the obstacle, which I would say one of those obstacles might be selfishness, agitation, fixation, thing of that nature. So if those things, selfishness, fixation, kind of tension, in a way goes down, then in a way, I would say, you're left with something which is not grasping. And if you don't grasp, it seems to me that what actually can happen is our creative potential can call more to the fore. Because in a way, what we notice when we meditate, in terms of thought, sensation, uh, feeling is that generally what we experience when we meditate is relatively repetitive. This is a thing that we see, oh, I keep thinking that, oh, I keep feeling that, oh, I keep having this kind of sensation. And then we can, with the awareness, see, oh, I keep doing often the same thing in terms of relationship, in terms of work. So in a way, we partly start within the repetition. Of course, some repetition is useful because you need continuity. But if you have too much repetition, then you're going to be a little stuck because you're kind of going to repeat very similar things. And so if you repeat very similar things, then there is very little opportunity for creativity. And so in a way, it's like uh, the meditation helps us to not be so stuck in this automatic, automatic repetition. And so I think that the meditation helps us to come back to what I call creative functioning. So you think, you feel, you have sensation, you have relationship, you were, but you approach it, you could say with more immediacy, and also there is more possibility for creative potential creative awareness, because we're not going on so much on automatic. Because often, we will do something because I have done it in the past, and I'm going to do it in the future. But not necessarily so, because if we bring freshness to the thing, then what is required right now? What is appropriate right now? So if we go to meet somebody, 
we're going often to meet them like how we saw them a week ago or a month ago. But you have changed. A month, from a month ago, you've changed. Even from a week ago, you could change. Because a week ago, a month ago, you could have been very stressed or very happy. And then you go, like, you know, you could, a month ago, you could have met your friend and they were in such a good place and fantastic. And you said, let's meet again. Let's have, you know, a good time again. And then you meet again and they are in a really bad place. And you might be also in a bad place. And so the two of you might be like, kind of lamenting, lamenting. Instead of you had that vision, we're going to have such a fun light time. And so if you like kind of, oh, but I wanted this to be fun, that might not be so helpful. But if you see, oh, my friend is not so well, I am not so well, how can we be here for each other? How can we support each other right now? So in a way, it's kind of like to be with what happened. And of course, we bring our potential with it, our capacity, which we develop over time. But I think the creativity is a little bit this idea of coming to what happens with a, a certain freshness. And that's why often in daily life, I would use this, uh, let's see what happens. I don't know what's going to happen, so let's see what happens. And let's, I'm going to try to bring to it some stability and some brightness. So that's what I meant, in short, for creative awareness. Thanks. Uh, I believe there is somebody called Miriam online, and she has a question for us, but I'm not sure. Miriam, do you want to ask the next question? If so, please go ahead. Um, hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Miriam. Okay, yeah. Hi there. Um, I don't know how long ago this uh, meeting started. I think I came in at the right time, um, about 20 minutes ago. Is that right? Right, yeah. Oh, yeah, fine. Okay. Um, I, um, um, I was just wondering about how troubled one should be about understanding, like, I'm relatively new to this. And I find it very confusing that there are so many different types of meditation. Um, I can't always identify which traditions they belong to. Sometimes they appear to go by diff the same type of meditation, seems to go by several different names. Um, and I'm just wondering, you know, how troubled or not I should be about any of that. Um, you know, what do you recommend for someone who's relatively new to meditation? You know, where... You know, what, what, what can I make of this confusion? <laughs> Sorry, that question isn't very well articulated, but maybe it but, made some sense. Yeah, I see what you mean. The thing is that in different places, you're going to encounter different things. And also, there is a fact that things start to change because of uh, condition. For example, long ago, uh, you had what was called the Pasana meditation. Then this then became more known as insight meditation. Then this became more known as mindfulness meditation. And now that mindfulness has become such a word that everybody knows, then now everything becomes mindfulness. But then you end up finding mindfulness in the Tibetan tradition, in the Song tradition, when before they did not, they did not use to use that name. So then when they talk about mindfulness, are they talking about the mindfulness of the inside tradition or are they talking the mindfulness which you could bring out from their tradition? So you already have that, even with mindfulness. So I think in a way is what you're going to encounter a little bit. Because nowadays you can encounter Zen, you can encounter Tibetan Buddhism, you can encounter the mindfulness inside practice, but you can also encounter people who do Thich Nhat Hanh, uh, Vietnamese uh, Buddhism, modern Vietnamese Buddhism, or you can meet people who do pure land Buddhism, or you can meet like Samatha tradition, we say just concentration, or you can meet the three right now, I'm just looking at Ireland and England, uh, who have created their own thing. And so I think that's why when I teach myself, I try to come 
back to the essential. And to the two, if we talk about meditation, two essential components that then you can find everywhere else, which is anchoring, focusing, concentration, which means basically that you come back to an object. You come back either to the breath or to the body or to the sound or to a question or to a mantra or to a visualization or to just sitting there. So in a way, the anchoring generally is very similar in terms of all these different traditions, even if you have a different object. So then with the object, some people, if they're asthmatic, I would not recommend the breath. If you have tinnitus, I would not recommend necessarily uh, the sound. If you have a lot of pain in the body, sometimes mindfulness of the body can work or not. You also have a whole series of meditation on loving kindness. So then the anchor is coming back to the phrases or to the quality of loving kindness. So in a way, I think it's more to see that meditation, it's good to have an anchor. It's good to come back to something because I'm going to be distracted at the beginning and I come back to something. And then you have to see what can I come back to, what seems to work for me. Working means that it can make sense and it's not complicated. So you can come back to the breath, to body, to the sound, to a phrase of loving kindness, to a mantra, to a visualization, to just sit it. It doesn't matter. The fact that you come back to something, so that will help with being more present, less stuck in the automatic repetition, and coming back a little bit to the creative functioning and creating space. Then the way to do the experiential inquiry is very different. So you can have just being aware of change. To me, that, that's what generally I would recommend, to just be aware of change. And then you can do that with the breath, with the sensation, with the sound. Just be aware of breath. With the loving kindness, the questioning is kind of looking beyond at the way you look at yourself, you look at others really seeing them beyond your perception, your history, and really meeting the human being like yourself to suffer. With the different type of uh, Tibetan meditation, they have different way of questioning. Uh, with the song practice, it's just either not grasping or it's asking a question. So that again, it's easier to do the anchoring than to do the look, the questioning experiential inquiry. And then the second aspect, different people will do it in different ways. Personally, I would recommend to either ask a question because that's relatively easy to do, or just being aware of change. And that will bring that element within the practice. But again, that can be done in so many different ways. So I think personally, I would say generally keep it simple. Mm -hmm. Keep it simple, do what is a, most simple thing to do and also to see if it's fruitful. But I mean, the final thing, which is also very important, is not just the fact that you try to anchor, you try to focus, you try to be, for example, aware of change, but it's how you do it. This is extremely important. That the way you are mindful, the way you anchor, the way you look deeply is not hands. So this is not like a checking meditation. This is not like giving myself a hard time meditation, but really to bring some friendliness, some care, so that when you try to anchor, it's not because the thoughts are bad, they're just thoughts, it doesn't matter, it's just the fact that you come back. So in a way, if you, for example, you use a breath, and then you become distracted, and you come back, because when you go into the breath, you're only experiencing a small, part of your experience. When you come back to the breath, you come back to everything. So the anchoring is to bring you back to the multiplicity of your experience. So it's not, and thought are part of the experience. So you're aware of the thought, and then you come back to the breath. So aware of the thought, come back to the breath. So I think what is so important when we practice whatever meditation, is that we really do it in a friendly and caring way. That I think is very essential. That would be my 
short reply to your question. That's very helpful. Thank you very much. Uh, is there an, another another question? Yeah, don't talk, talk to the camera. Oh, um, hi, it's uh, talk, talk the camera. Just moving. <laughs> um, the meditation that Son does. Uh, what is this? How, how do you go about that? So uh, the the, the practice. Yes, if you read the book, you will see Stephen has a little different take on it. Uh, Stephen's take is merely to ask, "What is this?" I don't know what this is, I don't know. So kind of really uh, pointing out, trying to be with uncertainty. Personally, if I look at the schema that I presented of anchoring and questioning, the, the question, what is this, becomes the anchor. So you ask what is this, but you have to see that when we do what, uh, ask this question, this is not the practice of answering. We're not looking for an answer. This is really a practice of meditation to develop a certain type of flexibility, of creativity, you could say. And so you just ask a question to, for its own sake, and what you're trying to develop is a sensation of questioning in the whole body and mind. So in a way, you're trying to become a question mark. So you ask, what is this? So the anchor is the fact you come back to the question again and again. But you're not repeating the question like a mantra. What is it? What is it? Not at all. But you ask a question because you don't know what is it. And you could say you can do it in two ways. One way is to throw the question to the moment. What is this? In a way, asking what is this whole moment? And open totally to it because you're not fixing anything in it. So generally, we are in the moment and all oh, this or that. With this question, it's more like saying, what is this? And really opening to the whole moment. Or you can ask, what is this with the breath? Uh, there was one teacher in Korea who would say, you breathe in, and as you breathe out, you ask, what is this? You breathe in, and as you breathe out, what is this? And so when you ask the question, what is this, not with the breath, you ask a question, what is this? And there is a little sensation of questioning. And when that goes, then you come back to what is this? And so what we have to see is that like any practice, it might suit some people. Some people really like it because it really brings brightness. And some other people, they, what is this? What is that? Why am I asking this stupid question? Then if you feel like that, you better not do it. Some people, they ask, what is this? And immediately it gives them lots of thought, then don't do it very much. Uh, and then it's better to do the breath or the body or listening and then just time to time to drop it in. Some other people, they do what is this and then it makes them anxious. Again, it's better to do the breath, the body is the sun, and then time to time drop the question in. So the question is just to, and what is very important is not to ask a question with the head, we're not, what is this, what is this, and dancing up around it. But we try to bring the question into the body. So it's kind of nearly like we visualization, visualizing the question in the belly and asking the question from the belly so that there is not this energy in the head. So that's in short uh, how to do this question. But when the book comes out, then you get all the explanation. Ah. Uh, thank you very much. Anybody have any observation or questions, either here in the room or amongst our audience around the world? Miriam is in Ireland. I don't know where anybody else is. I have a question. Um, what led you to your practice? And did you meet your husband or partner through the practice? Or... Like, is it, a shared, is it a shared interest that you've found together, or did you meet them? <coughs> so that's very personal, so don't feel like you have to answer that. <laughs> right. Um, actually, I uh, decided to become interested in meditation because I read uh, at a friend's place a, uh, a book, an early text from the Buddha, and in it, 
I think at that time I was very uh, into politics, wanting to change the world. And then in the book, the Buddha had this kind of phrase, before you want to change others, maybe you should change yourself. And I thought, this is a good idea. I mean, I, I can tell myself, don't be egoist, don't be jealous, don't do this, don't do that. It had no effect whatsoever. So I thought, he has a point. If me, I cannot change myself, how can I change others? So I thought, yeah, meditation would be a good idea to work with my habits, and then I'll see if I can help others. And in terms of meeting Stephen, <coughs> Stephen, I mean, I became a nun in 75 in Korea, uh, and Stephen became a monk in 74 in India. And then after studying for uh, four years, I don't know, for quite a few years uh, in India and then in Germany, he wanted to do some practice. Well, but he did practice in Tibetan Buddhism, but he wanted something a little different in terms of practice. And then a friend of his uh, just was traveling through Korea. I showed him around. And then he said uh, to Stephen back uh, in Germany, I think he was at the time, I found this place, the Buddhism, uh, the meditation is very interesting. Maybe you should check it out. And then so Stephen came to Korea to study uh, the practice of questioning, actually, because it really was interesting for him. And then I was uh, one of the foreign nuns left, actually, because there were lots of people before me, then they all left, and then I was left. Stephen arrived, I showed him the ropes, and then more people came after that. So basically, over time in the monastery, we, I mean, we both had similar interests. Uh, but we got to also know each other because we, uh, I was the one who had been there the longest and after a while he was a guy who had become there the longest and so we worked together to help uh, other people. Well, thank you. Good. Maybe we'll uh, stop here? I think so. Um, th thank you, Martine. That's been a very interesting session. I realise it's just completely off, off the cuff and that, that was very rewarding. Uh, thank you to, uh, and the, I think there's another three people around the world somewhere who's listening on this, but I have no idea who you are. Thank you for taking part. And thank you. Just to, just to say that um, on Monday evening, New Zealand time, we're going to be having uh, our usual twice, uh, one of our twice monthly meditation sessions. So please have a look at onemindfulbreath.org.nz under the events page and join us if you feel like it. So. Thank you very much, and thank you, Martine. And Sorry, um, Ramsey? What? Ramsey, could I, just, could I just ask you one question? Can I invite other people to come to that session? Of course you can. Of course okay. you can. Yeah. very welcome. Yeah, okay, thanks very much. All right. So, bye-bye. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.